Okay. Hi, Jason. Are you ready to start? I am. Yes, we're ready. To yes, start. I'm ready when you are ready. Okay. Can we? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for bringing us back this afternoon for your holy words again, Lord. We give you praise and thanks for being in the midst of us. We ask that you will forgive us of us things. And as we listen and as we take notes and as we ask questions, we pray that all things will be according to your will. Thank you so much for your blessings and your grace in our lives. In Jesus' precious name, with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. We welcome you again, Elder Wilson, and we pray that the Lord will continue to bless you. Amen. Thank you, and once again, it's a great pleasure. Uh, this evening, I'm going to share a subject that is possibly the most difficult disease to deal with, and that is dealing with different types of end-stage kidney disease. Oh. It's extremely difficult to work with. And I've had some measured success with it, but it is a difficult problem. Uh, I'm talking about people on dialysis, uh, renal failure, creatinine level, off the chart, hasium level, and you name it, kidney stones. Kidney stones is not that difficult, but once they go on dialysis, it is a tough battle. And I wanted to share this subject with my students here and I didn't get a chance to do it. So I figured I'd just present this this evening. So those people that are on dialysis uh, may have a chance they can get off of dialysis. And those people that's got a lot of severe kidney failure, they can have some hope that there is a chance. And I said small chance that they can live a normal life. Uh, First thing you do when you work with someone with kidney problem, you must do an assessment. You have to do assessment. I'm doing this class for my students and, uh, and we had quite a few students all over the world, right at a hundred students with the students here and the students on Zoom. I was taking a 30 day, very intense medical missionary physician training course. So we let you all get introduced into that type of training. So if any of you decide that you wanna take a training that would qualify you to take on some of the most difficult cases in the world, you get a free introduction. So the first thing you do when you work with somebody uh, that has end-stage kidney failure, you need to do an extensive uh, assessment of them. And that's with every problem. You need to find out how well are your kidneys working. And that's the key point. And so you keep a log of everything. You date it, you, uh, any information that you can get from the dialysis or the urologist, make note of that. And you definitely wanna uh, have a graph, an idea about the kidney disease, the function and the disease. This is a simple graph here that measured the glomerular results of kidney failure. Uh, if the kidney is working less than 15%, there's hardly no chance that you can recover the full function of the kidney. I said almost no hope, but there's always hope. You do it anyway. But that tells me that the kidney is almost dead and has lost his ability to filter uh, well enough so that the tissue can maintain a proper function. Anything above 15%, you've got a good chance that you can recover your kidney function. So um, you want to have it up at least above 55. Uh, your urologist can explain that to you. On a normal basis, the kidneys run above 55 to 60. But in stage kidney failure, as it dropped down from 40, 35, 25, 20, and then below 15, that's showing that the kidneys are not working, not filtering properly. So this can help you. You log your, your patient 
each time or each month or whenever you want to check them, you find out what their kidney functions are. The dialysis clinic may not give this information unless you request it. You talk to your, your, your physician, you request that information, tell them you want to be up on top of the progress or the decline of your kidney so you can make the proper decision. If your kidney is studied dropping, then uh, you know that the program you're on is not working. So you need to make drastic steps to try to improve it. The GFR of 60 or higher is the normal range. The GFR below 60 may mean kidney disease. And you need to be aware of that. The GFR of 15 or lower may mean kidney failure. So you got, you got a starting point and you got a goal. And that is to get it for the normal range. And if you can do that, you can reverse end stage kidney failure. So we're going to look at the progression or digression of it so that we can have a clear, clear idea of what we can do to help somebody. So what is the GFR? G -G GFR stands for glomerular filtration rate. The G FR is a measure, measurement of how well your kidneys are filtering blood. So your kidney is that main organ that clean up your blood. Everything go through the blood, everything. But everything cannot remain in the blood. So it's a filtering system. If that filtering system breaks down, then a lot of sediments are going to end up where it should not be. And that can cause inflammation and many other problems. Remember the fundamental principle that any usable uh, or unusable element that is circulating in the blood that remains in the body become a free toxin, a free radical, or an offensive protein. Because there's no mechanism in that particular area outside of the gastric tract or the intestinal tract, or the mouth to break down that particular offended protein. And so it becomes an offensive protein, even if it's a good healthy protein, there's nothing there that can break it down. There's nothing can break that protein down to amino acids. There's nothing that can break down that carbohydrates to glucose. There's nothing there that can break the fat down to fatty acids. So even though it's a good food, it can be a deadly irritant to the system. It's out of place. It's in the wrong area. Do we understand that? So you want to make sure that you don't overload the system, even with good food. Overloading the system with good food can be a challenge, uh, and good food can be just as deadly as harmful food, especially if it's not being processed properly. Your urine albumin results, you want to know what that is. So you want to check that and date that so that you can keep a log of that. Your urine albumin results below 30 is normal. If it's above 30, it means kidney disease. Okay, it means kidney disease. What is your urine albumin? What is the functions and the purpose of it? Up here, that red is your blood. And here, the, um, the uh, Filtering system is that little white line. And then down at the bottom, a kind of orange looking or yellow looking is your urine. Is so the purpose is to get the albumin out of the blood, filter it, and so it can go to the urine so it can be expelled out of the body. So in other words, it goes through the filtration system and now it's filtering it from the blood, it's cleaning it up. And it, when it works like that, there would be no sediments of albumin left in the blood. So that means the kidneys function as well. But if that remains, that protein, albumin remain in the blood, that means the filtering system has failed to be able to clean it up. And it can build up and build up and build up and cause a problem over time. When that happens, you're gonna have a problem with elevation ammonia level. Ammonia level can scare you to death because I have had cases of patients with 
kidney failure and their ammonia level go up and you think they've drunk, drunk a fifth of whiskey. They're just like they drunk. <clears throat> and you don't know what's going on. You go in there and you see them, they're talking out their head, they're talking crazy and you say, wow, what's, what's happening to this person? And what it is that, uh, that uh, ammonia level, the ammonia level is too high. The kidney is not able to filter that ammonia level. And you can smell it on their breath. And so that's because it's not filtering properly. Okay, any point now you need me to explain, there's no need to listen to me if you don't understand. So, uh, and because of that, you're gonna experience a loss of appetite. Mm -hmm. can be one or two cysts on the kidney. It can be polycystic kidneys. You can have polycystic kidney. It can be a lot of cysts on the kidney. And when you have polycystic kidney, uh, cysts on the kidney, it can also cause you to have high blood pressure and many other uh, renal failure. So yes, you can have uh, a poly, means many cysts on the kidney. Notice your urine. If your urine is foamy, that is a sign that your ammonia level or your albumin level is out of balance. Difficulty urinating, a frequent urination can be a sign that either you're having a problem urinating, that means there's some kind of obstruction, possibly an infection somewhere that is hindering the flow of urine out the body. Or there could be a, a case where constrictions has taken place and shutting off uh, the urethra uh, or the urinary, uh, shutting down the urinary system because of an infection. Uh, it could be a swollen prostate gland. It could be simply the body is losing the ability to discharge urine out of the system. That urine becomes stagnated and uh, created even a more hazardous problem. So you wanna make sure anytime you're working with a dialysis patient or a patient that have kidney problems, you wanna make sure you monitor their blood pressure. Anytime a person have a prolonged high level of blood pressure, they're gonna have several key problems. They're gonna have cardiovascular problems. They're gonna have some major kidney problems. It's gonna go with it because in the end, it's gonna catch up with you. You cannot have high blood pressure over a long period of time without some collateral damage somewhere else. So you may be able to function, you may be able to function fine, but in the end, it's gonna catch up with you. Uh, there's so much those arteries can endure before they start creating major problems. So if you have it, you have, you have basically two choices. You can go on palliative care by taking medication, at least that'll give you some time. Or you can go on a a, a natural biological program to try to eliminate what is causing the high blood pressure and remedy that with a natural approach. So those are your choices. You don't have any other choice but to die. So I encourage you to make a choice. Don't be like the Meserals. You know, they decided they didn't want to do wrong and they didn't want to do good, so they didn't do nothing. And God can't stand that neutral ground. I mean, that's he would rather you do something wrong than to do nothing at all. At least if you do something wrong, he can say, hey, you're going the wrong way. But if you're not going to do anything, God can't tell you nothing. You say, I ain't doing it. So if you need to take blood pressure medicine, take it. You take it. And in the meantime, you start trying to find out what can I do to get off of this blood pressure medicine. Okay? It's not addictive. So Stay on it, monitor your pressure, take it when you need it. And um, then I know people, they say, well, you know, I'm a Christian believer. I don't believe in drug medication. You have not been that way all your life. And your family have not been that way all their life. Uh, they have not been faithful Christian believers. They have not been following faithful health principles. So once again, the curse cause this shall not come. I mean, um, just because you clean up your diet and lifestyle, that do not mean that justification rendered you perfection instantly. It won't do it. 
yes, to acknowledge that eating that garbage has caused harm to my body. You repent of that. God accept your repentance. That don't mean you're perfect again. That don't mean you fixed all your organs. That simply means God said, okay, I understand you made some mistakes. I'm going to give you a chance now to correct those problems. That's sanctification. And you ask God, how long I got to eat like this? You say, how long do you want to be to reach perfection? Okay. How long do you want to obey? The minute you stop want to obey, then you got to go back to justification again. You got to turn around and go back and slay that lamb again. And if you keep doing it, there remains no more sacrifice. You've exhausted your vital force. So you need to control your blood pressure so that it will not burden your kidneys. And if you continue to do it, it would increase your risk and it would damage your kidneys and reduce your kidneys from functioning properly. And you can end up with end stage kidney failure. So what your kidneys uh, should do, the two kidneys, they're in, their main job is to filter waste and extra water out of the body through the urine. That's the main job of it. How your kidneys, how your kidneys are checked. In other words, you go, how are you going to check your kidneys? Two tests are used to check for kidney disease. A blood test check your GFR, which tell how well your kidneys are filtering. Okay, so a blood test will let them know where's your GFR, which will tell you how well your kidneys are filtering. Remember, you want to keep those, that GFR close to 60 as possible. And you do not want it to drop below 15. You don't want that. You can also do a urine test to check the albumin in your urine as a sign of kidney damage. You want to make sure that if you are a diabetic and having kidney problems, you want to check your ketones because if you are diabetic and you eat and run your blood sugar up and you know you need to go for a power walk, you could actually damage the function of your kidneys. If you're diabetic and your ketones are elevated, you should not do any strenuous exercise. All you're going to do is increase the ketones, which would accelerate the destruction of your filtering system in your kidneys. Do we understand that? Now, there is an occasion where we do need to walk, and that is when we know our kidneys are functioning properly. So sometimes we, we just go overboard and say, hey, I just ate you. I'm going to walk this thing off. You didn't check your ketones. And so you go on that walk and you bring more damage to your body. You've got to know, and you cannot be guessing because a person's life is dependent on you making the right decision. And there's a need to check your kidneys. You need to have your kidneys checked because you cannot feel kidney disease. You can't feel it. We could have it now and not even be aware of it. The kidney tests are very important for people who have diabetes especially if you got underlying uh, problems such as diabetes and high blood pressure, a heart disease, you should have your uh, kidneys checked on a regular basis because uh, one particular problem can actually cause another problem. What happens if, if you have kidney disease? Kidney disease, kidney disease can be treated sooner you know you have kidney disease, the sooner you can get treatments to help delay or prevent kidney failure. It's an amazing how doctors make those statements. They make those statements in a way that it's subliminally is telling you it's going to help you. That is not what's being said here. And they're not saying they're curing you. But subliminally, that's what you read. Because you go there to get help. And so it's favorable news because he tell you the sooner you come and get it checked, the sooner you can get the treatment to help, it will help delay uh, and prevent kidney failure. Said, I like that. So what is it? It's nothing but palliative care. That's all it is. 
He's simply saying, I'm going to help you, and we're going to try to stop you from accelerating going into kidney failure. But in the end, you're going to end up with kidney failure. That's really what it comes down to. In the end, you're going to get it, but at least we can give you more time, and maybe we can hold off from you having a heart attack or something like that. So the treatment goals is to keep your GFR from going down and to lower your urine albumin level. So those are the two keys we have to focus at. And doing that, we must keep our blood pressure, our glucose level, our blood glucose level, and our cholesterol within a target range. We have to do that. But we have to know what that target range is. We need to know what our blood sugar level should be. We should need to know what our blood pressure is. And we need to know what our cholesterol level is. We need to know what our HDL cholesterol and what function of it. We need to know what our LDL cholesterol and what its function because it's important to know that. If we know that our HDL cholesterol is real low, that automatically is gonna raise our what? LDL cholesterol. And if our LDL cholesterol is elevated, that means the HDL cholesterol is designed to sweep out the fat deposits in the arteries, it can't do its job. It can't do its job because the HDL cholesterol is too low, it can't clean out the fat. And so the fat remains in the arteries and that's gonna cause problems. That is why we have to have that HDL cholesterol at a higher level. And most of us vegetarians are gonna run into LDL cholesterol is because we love fats and grease. Fats and grease is a perfect recipe for trans fatty acids, okay? You don't have to eat meat to have these problems, to have high LDL cholesterol, a cardiovascular problem. Eat plenty of fats and grease. Uh, fats and oils, especially if it's cooked. And you will end up the same way a meat eater is doing that. People have a hard time understanding that vegetarians are having problems just like meat eaters are having problems is because we have learned to cook and to flavor our food to taste just like meat eaters eat. And we mimic their eating. Only person you're tricking is yourself because your body cares nothing about what it is. All it wants is the nourishment. So you say, well, I'm not going to eat no fried chicken, but you eat fried tofu. Mm -hmm. Now the body is going to analyze it. It's going to say, okay, fried chicken is protein, fat, and seeds, and flour. They know what that is. Then you say, well, I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to eat fried tofu. Your body going to say, fat, flour, protein, and season. The same system that breaks the chicken down is the same system that overburden eating food that is mimicking the chicken. If you overindulge in that, it's going to create the same problem, same identical problem. God knew this. God put us on a high, complex carbohydrate diet. He did that. He gave that to a perfect man so that that man could remain perfect. And there was nothing imperfect about what he did for Adam. It wasn't until man fell from grace that man learned to cook his food. As he cooked, he denaturized it, he devitaminized it, he demineralized his food. His body began to suffer from mineral and vitamin depletion. He was not nourishing his cells, so it accelerated his cellular death. And as his cells die, his organs die, his system was put out of harmony, and his system died, his body died. So to recuperate that, we're gonna have to go back as close to God's plan as possible. We need to be eating about 80 to 85% complex carbohydrates. If we did that, there'd be no obesity, there'd be no high cholesterol, there'd be no cholesterol problem, there would be no disease. And truly, God's people would be disease free. They would be. We would be a reflection of what God had intended Adam to be. Instead, now we are laughing stocks because people say, I eat all those fake meat, y'all got the same problem we got. 
I mean, what's the advantage of eating that all that little fake food? You got high blood pressure, you got diabetes, you got everything they got. So what's the difference? God intended something better for us. And it's a high calling though. And we, we need more physical activity. We need that to burn up those calories. We need to get rid of all those health destroying habits, get them out and quit doing them. We need to seek out natural methods to systematically feed our body with wholesome nutrients to reverse the course of disease. We need to do that. We need to educate people about chronic disease and other diseases. Uh, we need to talk with them and, and make them aware of what's going on in their body. So let's talk a little bit now about chronic kidney disease. It means that the kidneys are damaged and no longer filter in blood well. This damage happened over many years. As more damage occur, the kidneys are unable to keep the body healthy. Then dialysis, uh, our kidney transplant may be needed to take the place of a kidney that should be able to do the job but cannot do it because of our self-abuse. So remember that this condition has developed over many years. It didn't happen overnight. You're not gonna reach a conclusion of cure overnight either. We have eaten ourselves into this condition. We're gonna to have to eat ourselves out of this by making better choices and better decisions. And the kidney constantly grow and remodel themselves. This was the most encouraging news when I saw that. Because I really felt that kidneys, once they reach a certain uh, developmental stage, that was it. But research has revealed that the kidneys are constantly regenerating themselves. They're constantly regenerating themselves. That is encouraging news. And that happened because God created the body to self-generate itself. God created us to self-generate because God never intended for us to die. Our organs were to replace themselves. Every organ in our body has replaced itself. From a medical and biological standpoint, nothing is immortal but God. All right? Everything have a lifespan in a lifetime. You understand what I'm talking about? At some point, it's going to die. All right? And God is truth and everything else is a lie. When God created us to live forever, did God change his mind? No, he didn't. God never changed his mind. We may have changed, but God didn't change. So, based on science, Every organ changes itself. You pluck your fingernail, it can grow back. You break a bone, what can happen? It can knit back. You cut your hair, it can grow back. That regenerating process is in every organ in our body. Do you know how long it takes a heart to wear out if it wasn't self-generating? Here we 60, 70, 80, 100 years old. You think that same heart been with you all those years? It was a long war. Hmm. That heart has been changed many, many times. But God is such a wonderful architect that it made the wisdom of this world that he can bring about this marvelous exchange of the heart even missing a beat. If he can form a man out of a lump of clay, he can formulate a heart through the regeneration process. God can do those things. We can't figure it out. There's no way we can mathematically figure that out. How, is, how could that heart be changed every 30 days? How can those lungs be replaced every 45 days? How can a human body be replaced every seven years? And we never miss the moment. Only God. Maybe get in the king, you can ask him who did it. But he architected the human body. And no science, no technology will ever duplicate that. And so because of that, if we get in harmony with God's plan, we won't die. You won't die. Now, you may sleep, 
But what I read, God is a God of the living and not the God of the dead. All right? That's what I read. So it may be good for some of us to take a nap. That may not be a bad thing. But you're not dead if you're in the Lord. So the kidneys are constantly growing and remodeling themselves. It was thought that the kidney cells did not reproduce much once the organ was fully formed. A new research showed that the kidneys are regenerating and repairing themselves throughout our life. You can take a kidney from someone else, put it in another person's body, and it will knit and stop functioning. All right? You can take an organ out of a person's body, set it on a bowl in this table, and those parts will still be, and the cells will be still functioning. And it's not even tied to the heart. Dr. Kellogg proved that. I know what I'm talking about. Dr. Kellogg proved it. He took the heart out of a chicken, put it in a sterile solution. He kept that heart beating for 21 years. And it wasn't even connected to nothing. Every day they had to change the toxic water. The heart died when somebody forgot to do it. Ain't that something? It's toxicity that's killing us. This air is toxic. Everything we involve is killing us. This research was discovered at Stanford University, stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. That's, they discovered that, and that was good news for dialysis patients because now it opened a pathway for new treatments and repair that we can give. We can give kidney patients, dialysis patients, new hope. Do you know that one of the best things that if a person got to have grow new cells and new organs is stem cell research? I'm not talking about this amalgamation that the medical system is doing, growing organs from animals. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the, the South American sunflower. The South American sunflower is what medical science is turning to to research stem cell growth. The protein in those sunflowers can accelerate regeneration of cells and tissue by using a plant-based substance. It's fantastic. Um, these are the basis findings that have direct, direct implications for kidney disease and kidney regeneration. The finding was published online May 15 from the cell report. It has long been thought that the kidney cells did not reproduce much once the organ reached their full uh, development. But new research have opened up new fields. This research tells us that the kidney is no longer a way of static organ. In other words, it is studying, growing, and developing. It is doing that. Cut a plant down. Cut a tree down. Will it grow back with the right environment? Do God think more of a tree than you? No, he don't. Cut a lizard tail off when they grow back. Some of them will. Kidneys are incredibly rejuvenated itself and continue to regenerate specialized kidney cells at all times. The research which was done on mice also showed how the kidney regenerated itself. So they're testing this out in the lab. And so uh, what can we do? to help our kidneys formulate and begin to function healthy again. If you have chronic kidney disease, this condition is getting worse. You've got to change your lifestyle and your approach. You need to have the proper medicine that will control your blood pressure. You need to have medicine uh, that would inhibit uh, the body from uh, working out of balance. So this can be approached from allopathic medicine or natural medicine. Allopathic medicine forced the body to temporarily relieve the symptoms. Allopathic medicine works on the symptoms of disease. Natural medicine does not work on the symptoms. It works with the symptoms and help 
produce the symptoms. And I know that's not good news, but symptoms are really a curative reaction. Symptoms are not a disease process. Ellen White talked about it. She said that a fever is a what? A friend. The medical system said fever is a what? Sign of sickness. She said fever is a sign of what? Good health. So what about diarrhea? Diarrhea is uncomfortable, it's annoying, it's a trouble, it's bothersome, it get on my nerve because I've got to stay close to the toilet, but really it is a curative reaction. It is the body trying to upload septic toxic waste out of the system. And if you had helped the body to do it, the body would have cleansed itself. But since you didn't do it, nature has taken control. It is milking those intestinal villi, pulling water from your intestines, running it to the colon and giving itself an enema. Nature will do that. You think nature ain't smart? You, you trip and twitch your ankle. I guarantee you, if you don't do nothing, it's going to swell up. It's going to swell up. That's a curative reaction. That swelling is a preventive. It is to prevent any toxic substance or inflammation from traveling up your leg to your knee to the rest of your body. The swelling contains the inflammation. And so we don't look at it like that, but nature is, has this self-protection built in to help us out. All we need to do is to learn how to help the body in this process. Let's see what we can do for high blood pressures if you don't want to turn to all the medicine. Now, I will say that Ellen White also brings out, if you eat bad and live bad, it may be a necessity that you take drugs. So I'm not telling everybody to stop taking drugs. I wouldn't do that. If you continue to eat bad, take it, all right? That's the smartest thing in the world to do. Take it if you've got a bad lifestyle. But if you want to make some changes, here's one that really works good and controlling your blood pressure. Vitamin B3 is a capillary dilator. In other words, it do this. That's dilating. When your arteries are doing this, your heart got to work much stronger. You want them arteries to do this. It's a pump and it's pumping that blood. But if you're doing that, the blood becomes stagnated and the heart got to work harder what pump the blood. You don't want that. You're going to bring about congested heart failure like that. Any machinery that is working and overheating is going to produce what? Congestion. Condensation. Congested heart failure. And the machine is going to break down. Cayenne pepper is a blood thinner. It thins and it's also uh, circulating. It's a warming agent so that the blood stays thin. Ginger works right in harmony with cayenne pepper. It is a blood thin. And Hawthorne berry is especially good for the cardiovascular system and for toning up the heart muscles, removing out congested heart failure. Garlic is a blood thinner also, antimicrobial, antibacterial, antifungal. So it's perfect for that. Magnesium relaxes the muscle to keep it from working so hard. Calcium strengthens the ligaments uh, in the heart. Coscrolin is another one that works good uh, to help strengthen the heart. And these amino acids, all amino acids, L-tyrene is an amino acid. It helps in the rebuilding of the cell wall. CoQ10 helps regulate the oxygen because it's an antioxidant. Potassium, life is built around potassium. If you have no potassium, then you are in a lot of trouble. Mistletoe is there is a really good antibody and it's good for your immune system. l arginine is an amino acid. Uh, tryptophan helps calm the system down. And so mixing all these together is a wonderful combination to help your whole cardiovascular system. Mix it together and take this, a teaspoon of this in water uh, two to three times a day or more. It depends on how severe your condition is. If your condition is that you are diabetic and that's compromising the function of your kidneys, then you're gonna need a special program if you're not gonna be on allopathic medicine. You're gonna need arginine, 
uh, which is another amino acid, golden seal, which is a natural insulin, berberine, which is a natural insulin. Uh, you're gonna need uh, barberry, which is also, it tones up the, your cardiovascular system, organ grape. Or, organ grape also has natural insulin in it. And stevia is wonderful. It helps lower your blood sugar. Valde sulfate is a wonderful amino acid. It helps regulate your blood sugar to keep it from having the peaks and the lows. Uh, chromium, we need that to balance out your blood sugar level. Bilimelin is one of the best natural insulins you can have. Cinnamon will bring your blood sugar down by itself. And black pepper helps you metabolize all the rest of these different herbs. That's the only good function of that pepper, black pepper. Else it is trash, it is no good. But a little of it will help you assimilate and utilize the poor potentials of all these other herbs and vitamins. Well, <clears throat> this is in a powder form. Uh, you can make a liquid form. If you make it in a liquid form, then yes, you can keep it in the refrigerator or you can put something that'll keep it from going bad. But uh, in a powder form, you just take it, you know, in a powder. I know I don't use any uh, uh, spice. Uh, the cayenne is an herb. Uh, red pepper is a spice. African capsicum is an herb. It has to be at least 90,000 heat units or more. Anything under 90,000 is a spice, and that's an irritant. Will I need dialysis? Uh, with proper management, you may never need dialysis, or at least not for a very long time. But if your kidneys fail, you will need to choose a treatment that can replace the job of your kidneys. And you know, people are making this choice every day. And they don't have to do that. There are ways to avoid that. Reduce your salt intake. Salt. Uh, makes food taste good, but salt can cause a, a lot of problems in your system. You've got to reduce it because it can definitely cause a lot of edema. Your body holds a lot of fluid. It paralyzes your diuretic hormones. And we can easily consume too much salt in our food, in our canned foods, in our processed food. And in particular among African American, African Americans, they have a lot of problems. A series of classes study conducted by Ernest Hamburg in Detroit in 1970 was the first to really probe this question. He showed that blood pressure in African Americans living in the inner city was the highest in people living in the worst off neighborhoods. Now he found that out, but we can identify with that because in the worst, neighbor, worst neighborhoods, they have the worst food, they had the worst availability for health care. It's a stressful environment. And so consequently, with those combinations, yes, you're going to have it with a precondition for high blood pressure. And we inherit that precondition. When our ancestors brought over on the slave ships, they suffered tremendous dehydration. When they came over, they sweat all the salt out of their body and they became salt sensitive, which makes us a high risk of salt and it makes us more uh, prone to develop cardiovascular problems because of that. So how much salt should we eat? Uh, we should have in our food. About 1,500 milligrams of sodium equal to about 3 4 teaspoons of 3.75 grams of salt today, while 2,300 milligrams equal to about one teaspoon or six grams of salt per day. Most people today eat much more than that. The average intake of sodium is around 3,400 milligrams. Most of it coming in the form of processed food. So you see, we eat a lot more salt than we should eat. And the reason you're eating a lot of salt is because you're doing a lot of cooking. Because if you ate it raw, you wouldn't have to have salt in it. But when you cook, you leach out the salt. And so you got to add the salt back. The sodium salt is in the vegetable. If you didn't cook so much of it, you wouldn't need so much salt. Having a particular gene make 
African Americans more sensitive to salt, thereby increasing their risk of developing high blood pressure. And once again, they traced this all back to those slave ships. Uh, we was in Africa, we didn't, we didn't have no problems with that. You go to Africa now, they don't have the high rate of hypertension that we have in this country. African Americans, susceptibility to salt, which is called salt sensitivity, as little as one extra gram of salt, the amount of a half a teaspoon or a tablespoon of salt, free 100 milligrams, and one serving of, of some processed food could raise their blood pressure. And so let's look at some of those foods. We love fried foods. With fried foods, you've got to have what? Salt on those fried potato chips. Or else it's not gonna taste. It's gonna be too bland. You're not gonna want it. It's the salt that you're eating. It's not the potatoes because if you got rid of the salt, you wouldn't want the potatoes. But you can eat the salt without the potatoes, but you're not gonna eat the potatoes without the salt. That's a fact. Same with that chicken. You, that fish, you would not want to eat fish if it didn't have no salt in it. You complain. So you actually is addicted to the salt. And do you know with your cornflakes that in one cup of cornflakes, you have more than 200 milligrams of sodium, hidden sodium. You don't think about how you taste a little sprinkle of sugar on the flakes, but the hidden sodium is in the flakes. Your canned uh, soups and beans have about 1300 milligrams of sodium. Your frozen dinners have about 1,800 milligrams of sodium. And your soups are also, canned soups have a lot. Now look at these deli foods, and I'm talking about vegetarian. A slice of deli meat and a veggie hot dog are packed with sodium. One hot dog contains 700 milligrams of sodium. And you know you eat more than one veggie <laughs> hot dog. <laughs> One slice of regular belly deli ham contains 300 milligrams of sodium. So no wonder we got hypertension. We've already salt sensitive. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? You know that native Indians are alcohol sensitive, right? You know that. They get one little smell and they go crazy. <laughs> Cause they ain't used to it. The ancestors did not grow up sipping whiskey and vodka and all that stuff. And when it was introduced to them, they became alcohol sensitive. Well, we are salt sensitive, all right? I know you never thought about yourself like that. A can of tomato juice can have a, uh, it can be a sodium bomb of 700 milligrams every eight ounces. And ketchup? Ketchup have a whopping 1,000 milligrams of sodium free tablespoon. Do you think you would eat ketchup if it didn't have no salt in it? No, you wouldn't want to eat that. Eating that, you know, super looking tomato. I mean, you would not want it. It's the salt that you eat. Now, what about cheese? Cheese contain up to 400, 400 milligrams of sodium Three slices. You know you got to have more than one slice. So we need to choose low potassium food. Your dietitian may recommend that you choose low potassium food at each meal. High potassium food include bananas, oranges, potatoes, spinach, and tomato. Uh, tomato. You got if you're on dialysis, you I've got to give these up. All right, and a lot more gonna come with it because they are high in potassium. If your kidney is failing because of high potassium, there's a lot of things that can compromise your kidney. Potassium is the worst. It could be sodium, it could be phosphorus, it could be protein, it could be potassium, you know. Uh, so there are many other ways to do it, but potassium is the worst because all the good foods are high in potassium. You gotta give them up. So you need an example of a low potassium food be apples, cabbage, carrots, green beans, grapes, and blueberries. So you got to give up your bananas, your oranges, 
you got to get those up. And I'm going to go through some more. Your spinach and most of your green foods, you got to get them up. Your lettuce, your salads, you about got to get that up. Your broccoli, it's got to go. It's very high. You got to, it's got to go. So we need to substitute food that is low in potassium to keep from overburdening our kidneys. And if not, we're going to end up with kidney stones, kidney crystals, or stones, crystals uh, setting in the kidneys. Kidney stones are made up of salt and minerals in the urine that stick together, creating small pebbles formed within the kidney or the urinary tract. They can be as small as a grain of sand or as large as a golf ball. Mm -hmm. Kidney stones are a common cause of blood in the urine and often produce severe abdominal pain. One in every 20 people develop kidney stones at some point in their life. So um, one of the big problems with kidney stones is not drinking enough water. And that's the big problem with it. And most of the time when a person is on dialysis, they got on a water restriction, reduction program. They reduce their water because they retain in water. So they said, we can't drink that much water. So that's gonna create some more problems. And that's true, that's, that is absolutely true. But if you don't drink water, you're gonna get kidney stones. So what causes kidney stones? Kidney stones form when a change occur in the normal balance of water, salt, minerals, and other substances found in the urine. Other chemical compounds that can be can form stones in the urinary tract include uric acid and amino acids, pristine. Dehydration also can cause that. So if you're not drinking enough water, you can consume a lot of beans and grains and meat you're gonna pick up uric acid and purine acids. And that can eventually make kidney stones. So before I exhaust all the time, I wanna give you some, what you can do about it because so far it don't sound too good. <laughs> but there is good hope uh, in dealing with kidney stones. And, um, and I'm just gonna go over some of the things you can do and then we will close out. Uh, so what is the treatment for kidney disease and kidney stone? One of the best treatments in the world is cranberry juice, unsweetened cranberry juice. But you take that cranberry juice and you take a 16 ounce of unsweetened cranberry juice, put about two ounces of probiotic in it, about two ounces of probiotic in the cranberry juice. And then you need to get a cranberry concentrate. And you need to, you can get that in a liquid form, uh, concentrate, and you're gonna put about four ounces of cranberry concentrate. This is different than what I gave you for the prostate. It's different because when a person has kidney stones or dialysis, <clears throat> you can't give them that much vitamin C. So there's no vitamin C added to this one. But the other form that with prostate, you remember I had 20,000 milligrams of vitamin C. You don't wanna do that when you got kidney stones. So that can increase the development of stones. So you let a person drink that two or three ounces of that uh, a day for his kidney stones. And kidney stones can be small, or they can really get large. They can get up to nine to 10 um, millimeter in size. And that's too large for it to go through the urinary canal. And there you can see a stone, you can see a pin, and you can see a dime or a penny. And that stone get much bigger than nine or 10 millimeters, it's gonna get hung up. And that's a very painful situation. Make sure you keep yourself good and hydrated. Select the proper foods you need for your kidney health. Uh, one thing you want to consider, if you're thinking that your diet may be a problem, schedule an appointment with somebody, a medical missionary or somebody that's knowledgeable on food, and discuss the use of vitamin C and vitamin D, because vitamin C and vitamin D can increase your risk of kidney stones. So you need to understand that. 
And there are other foods that can do that also. You need to discuss your protein consumption, your sodium consumption. Uh, that too can cause problems. Your nightshades, and particularly your dark green vegetables, also can increase the risk of developing kidney stones. So it's almost like it's taking all the healthy food from you. Your potassium is a mineral that is found in many foods. It keeps the heart beating regular. It helps to maintain fluid balance and allow the nerve and muscles to work properly. So we need it. The kidneys are the main organ, organs that control the correct level of potassium in the blood. So if your kidneys are not working right, it's gonna be out of control. It's not gonna be able to control the balance. The kidney is the main organ that controls the balance of potassium. The kidneys are malfunctioning. So what happened to your potassium? It builds up <clears throat> and it becomes a toxin. So we go back to that principle, whether it's good or bad, if it's in an area that cannot metabolize it, it becomes toxic. Potassium is good for your heart, it's good for your muscles, it's good for your nerve, but if that potassium is where it cannot be metabolized, that potassium, potassium can have a negative effect on your body. And so that means that if that person is on a dialysis because of high potassium, that means you must what? Reduce the potassium in his diet because excessive potassium will kill his kidneys. And so um, that means that we're gonna have to find out how to reduce it. First of all, we're gonna have to uh, make sure that we go on a low potassium diet. Low potassium in fruit, low potassium in vegetables. We're gonna have to do that. And all our dairy products and calcium, you really need to give it up, but no more than two servings uh, with low potassium in it twice a week. You really need to give it up. All your meat and meat substitutes, up to two to three servings of low potassium and protein per week. Your grains must be low potassium. Now, uh, how do I cut down on potassium? Well, the first thing you do, you cook your food. You see, this is violating all health principles. You cook your vegetables. Cooking leaches out the potassium. Potassium is a water soluble. It leaches out in the pot lifter. Do not eat the pot liquor. All right, I don't care how good it tastes for cornbread. You don't want, you don't want to eat the pot liquor if you have high potassium, because that potassium is in the broth. You don't want that. You want to soak those vegetables a few hours or overnight, then cook them to pull out the potassium. The potassium will kill your kidneys because you cannot regulate it because you've lost that ability to do that. And so once again, soak them in water to pull out some of the potassium, then cook them. Then they can eat a small amount of that. They still can't eat a lot of that because the potassium is still there. And uh, your grains and your beans in particular, want your high protein such as meat and eggs and cheese uh, and beans, uh, you got to reduce that. Go on a low protein diet. And your cereals have to be a low protein diet. You got to do that to allow your body to rest, to rest, because this protein, potassium is a dangerous waste in the body because your body cannot excrete it out. So um, keep in mind that certain foods are really deadly for well, dialysis that's meat, fish, poultry, eggs, milk, yogurt, cheese, peanut butter. That is definitely deadly. You can get by with small amounts, very small amount of starches, bread, cereals, pasta, a very small amount of that in a very small quantity. Fruits uh, has trace amount of protein, fats and sugar has trace amount of protein. You can get by with that. And I hope it's a natural sugar. So reduce your, your protein consumption, your sodium uh, consumption, and, uh, and treat your problem. If it's phosphorus, you must log your phosphorus. Make sure you reduce your phosphorus foods. 
If it's sodium, reduce your sodium foods. If your creatinine level, which you're gonna run into, if your creatinine level is high, that simply means you're not drinking enough water. And that will definitely cause your creatinine level to go up and the creatinine level will kill your kidneys. All right, it'll kill it faster than anything I've seen. So I'm working with dialysis patients right now. And um, it's, a, it's a job, but I'm, in closing, I wanna show you how to, um, how to bring it down. Research is still going on, but what we have seen so far is that if your GFR has dropped, that means the filtering system in your kidney is not working right, and it's below 20, if you get 15, it's critical. You need one eighth teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate. You need that. And I'm not an advocate of that, but I'm telling you, this will save your kidneys. I have done it many times. My aunt was going in on Derby. She may be listening to this. In Memphis, Tennessee, she was going into total kidney failure. I put on this program in less than a month. She didn't need no dialysis. And a doctor says her kidney was in perfect health. One eighth of a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate. You know who I'm talking about, that's your own. Okay? So you, you, I know you people don't believe me. At least I got some checks. I got somebody can check me in here. My son and my other son, they know who I'm talking about. And Margaret, you know who I'm talking about. Tanya, you know who I'm talking about. That's baking soda. Try to get aluminum free. Red meat. Okay? And take that in water two or three times a day. What this will do is that baking soda will work wonders in reducing your creat, I mean, your um, uh, oak cleaning up your filtering system and changing the pH. It'll change that pH of your whole urinary system. And to lower your creatinine level, you need nettle. Uh, C, T. I got leaves. It should be nettle C. Not the leaves. It should be nettle C, T. This is vital. You have to have it. <clears throat> this will bring your creatinine level down and it will bring, take you out of renal failure if it is above 20. I think I was sick. <laughs> so nettle seed is a powerful kidney tonic. So Nettle right has significant effect on lowering your creatinine level, and it will definitely do it. Nettle is one a supplement that struck me to be very powerful. In a skeptic world, Nettle has proven a mighty warrior in helping people get off of dialysis and getting their kidneys back functioning properly. So um, once again, uh, the main pro program is to regulate their diet based on what is causing their kidneys to fail, whether it's sodium, phosphorus, potassium, creatinine level, whatever it is, reduce that. Take the stress off the kidneys, let the kidneys rest, rehydrate them, sweat them. Remember that fever bath and steam bath, the skin is a second pair of kidneys. The sweat will relieve the burden off of the kidney so you need to give them at least four or five sweat treatments a week. You can take that burden off. Charcoal is another one that helps the filtering system on the kidneys and you can reverse it. I'm gonna stop right there. I think I've given you enough. And if anybody's having a problem with dialysis and they uh, would like to get some help and we'll be more than happy to try to help them. So I'm gonna open it up for some questions. We still got uh, another program to go after this. So, um, and this is uh, for the people here in Zoom. Uh, uh, do y'all have any questions? Yes, we have a question from a listener, Elder Wilson. The question is, um, what recommendation would you give to a 33 year old with pancreatic cancer? did surgery, but don't want chemo. Did you get that? Have they had surgery? Yes, I got it. Have they, they had, had surgery? surgery, but yeah, but no chemo, but don't want to take chemo. Have they, 
Have they removed portion of the pancreas? Ah, uh, that person. Um, Sarifa, you would have to do That's some talking okay. here. Yeah. Unless uh, you want to have them un unmute and ask their questions, whichever is easier. Did you see? Yeah. You the person say the person say yes in the chat. Okay. Yes. Okay. So. Um, I mean, there, it's obvious I need to know more information, but this is a serious problem. But did they remove the tail of the pancreas or the head of the pancreas? I'd have to wait for her response. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you want to you wanna talk directly, I, Sarifa? Well, I think that in this case, I need to talk to this person privately. Okay. I think this is a very serious condition. Right. And I think this person needs to give me a call and I can counsel with them based on my experience of working with them. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's such a, a serious so it was the head of it. The head, yeah. Okay. But I'm going to give some general things what I would recommend. Uh, I would recommend after I had did an assessment, if they're diabetic, uh, I would want to know that. If they have blood pressure, I want to know that. And if they're diabetic, then I would want to correct that. And once I correct the diabetes, then I would try to get them in the best physical shape possible. I would put them on the program I just brought out here. Um, if they're obese, I would try to get some of the weight off of them and put them on this program with metal C, uh, by soda, sodium bicarbonate. I would put them on that. I would want to talk with them to find out what has compromised the function of their, of, of their pancreas. And if they tell me that, that diabetes did it, or whatever did it, or high blood pressure, whatever it is, then I would try to make some adjustments there. So I think a private consultation would work there. Uh, Sister Joanne, she know how to contact me at, in your church. You talked with her and she will put you in contact with me. The best time to catch me would be tomorrow morning I'm not very easy to catch, but <laughs> catch me early uh, in the morning would be good uh, at night. Okay. Uh, okay, it's, all right. Any other good question about pressure formula? Okay. But I would say that a person with pain credit cancer, they better be serious because this condition don't play. And you can't scrawl a defense. The medical system has no answers for you at all. You're wasting your time. Chemo, forget about it. It's, they have nothing for that. And so uh, my history has been about 35 to 40% success rate if I can catch them at a certain level. So um, I would say that your only chance would be allopathic, I mean, natural medicine, not allopathic medicine. Um, what is the net, what's it, what is one of the natural remedy for high blood pressure? May I ask, please? Well, you know, I gave a high blood pressure formula, but let's say if you got a critical uh, elevation of high blood pressure, you can take one bubble of garlic, chop it up, put it in a blender, and put it, uh, fill the blender up with spring water, and then you can drink some of that, and you can give yourself a retention enema. A retention enema is about anything less, anything less than six ounces, uh, four to six ounces of garlic tea, inject that in your rectum through a little small syringe. I don't want to produce a bowel movement. I want you to retain the garlic. Garlic is a solvent. It will absorb through your intestines, go to your liver, and go right to your bloodstream. Every time you do it, it will drop your pressure almost 10 points or more. Keep doing that. Take a hot foot bath, put a cold compress on your head and possibly one on your heart until you get your pressure down in a safe level. That is to deal with an emergency. To maintain your blood pressure, get one big eggplant, chop it up. Put about two to three bubs of garlic, chop it up, put it with the eggplant. Take about three to four tablespoons of mistletoe. Herb. If you don't have mistletoe, use colon seal. 
If you don't have gold and steel, use yarrow. Mix it in the tea. Set it up. Let it set for about three days in the refrigerator. Drink about two to three ounces, two or three times a day or more. Stop eating all salt for 10 days. Your blood pressure is going to start dropping. Monitor your blood pressure. As it drops, it may drop too low. And so you have to determine when to stop drinking this tea and then to incorporate a very small amount of salt in your diet, else it could drop your pressure too low. So those are some of the things that I would recommend along with that blood pressure formula that I gave earlier. Okay. Thank you. And I would like to um, add Elder Wilson for us here in Montreal that the little syringe, we can find it at John Coutu or any of the pharmacy. Right. So one of the uh, biggest thing, yeah. one of the things that we need in our churches, we're going to have to put more emphasis in educating our people to be healthy. We entered into a very serious crisis, and God's mm -hmm. people are ill prepared to deal with this crisis. And so that needs to be a major move to educate the people. That need to be Amen. training seminars, training schools to go in and train our people. And if we can get ourselves healthy, then we can win the world to the truth. Amen. There is a question in the chat if Hillamillion um, sea salt is better, is better than regular salt. Not for this here, it's not. It's still sodium. Uh, it's a, it <laughs> is a healthy salt. It's a very healthy salt. But the problem is they all have sodium. The sodium is the problem. Now, I know people got all kind of concept, but that salt is going to increase your sodium level. And then to increase your sodium level, it's going to make you have edema. It's going to make you hold fluids. So I, I'm totally against any high level of sodium until we get this thing under control. Another question, Elder Naaman, is that if a breastfeeding mom can take the high blood pressure formula? Well, there's nothing in there that would harm the baby, uh, especially with the amount the baby would get. I don't see anything that would cause any problem uh, with that myself. Now, if she is afraid of taking anything, then the eggplant tea would be fine, you know, uh, uh, the garlic animals would be fine, but myself, I see no problem with that. The person, Elder, Elder Wilson, that um, asks about the pancreatic cancer, apparently the question continued. They indicated they wanted to do chemo because they can't lymph nodes in the lymphatic system. They want to do chemo. They, they the want, the doctors want to do chemo because they said that the cancer spread to the lymphatic system. See, that doctor is not being truthful to you. See, even when the cancer spread, it's still uh, pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer do not change and become cancer of the lymph system. If you go to the lymph system, it's still pancreatic cancer that have moved to the lymph system. So you still got to treat it the same way you treat pancreatic cancer and chemo is ineffective dealing with uh, pancreatic cancer. Google it in, don't take my word for it. Google it in and ask the experts. They tell you that 3% can respond from chemo from pancreatic cancer. That, uh, that's out of 100, only 3% can have favorable results. Wow, you do the best with Russian roulette than that. So I, I, I mean, I'm saying don't take my word for it. Google it and find out will, will it help cancer to spread the lymph system. They give you the chemo because that's all they got. They don't have anything else. And it's a chance. They say, well, we don't have nothing else. Let's take a chance. It might work but they have no data to show that it works. I just had a young man just died doing really good without it. 
they could persuade him in to get the chemo in less than a week, the boy's dead. And his boy was, this boy came from death row, up driving, getting around, being with his family, having a good time, good health. Blood count dropped, took him to the hospital, gave him that chemo, put him to sleep. And so I am definitely saying, ain't no answer with chemo. Chemo is a cytotoxic drug. It's going to shut your whole body down. Now, if they want to give you something else, I may say, okay. But I ain't saying okay with no chemo because I know better than that. Uh, another question is that if someone who had a kidney transplant and is back on di dialysis, can he be helped? Well, what you can do is you strengthen the overall health of that person. That person is going to be on drugs the rest of his life to keep him from rejecting their kidney. You can't get him yeah. off of that. Because that's not, that's not his kidneys. But he can live a normal life, a very healthy life, by getting him at optimal health, physically uh, and spiritually. The reason they come back, the underlying problem was not dealt with. If he was a diabetic, they did not fix that. If he had high blood pressure, they didn't fix that. They gave him medications. Medication do not fix a problem. It simply cover it up. But the effects of that underlying problem still going to have an effect on that body. So you, you've got to deal with that underlying problem. And then, uh, you know, he would do a lot better. So I'm saying put him in the best health you can put him in physically, uh, get his body toned up, let him exercise, let him eat healthy, and the rest of his organs is compensate, and he should be fine. Thank you. There's another question. Um, are there are there recommendations for good intestinal health? It is. I mean, we should have two to three bowel movements a day. Uh, that's with the beginning. We should keep our body well and hydrated. We should eat plenty of roughage and fiber. We should exercise and pick our abdominal tract. Uh, we shouldn't eat when we're stressed out. We should eat about 85% complex carbohydrate foods. We should restore our intestinal flora by taking some form of uh, probiotics, uh, rejuvenate, some kind of way to return that flora back. Uh, yes, it, we would do real well by doing that. Is there a natural remedy for bipolar people? I just got through working with a girl in Switzerland with bipolar and she was that way and tried to commit suicide several times. And uh, she tried her since she was a teenager, had in all mental institutions. And she's probably listening to me right now. And um, she went on this program I gave her. She's totally healthy today. Oh. And her husband and her enjoying themselves, and she's back functioning with her family. You know what the problem was? Postpartum depression. And they misdiagnosed her with bipolar. A lot of time that can happen. That can happen. You know, the progesterone levels drop too low, and it drives you crazy. And there's a matter of bouncing it back out. So some things can correct those problems. Is it good or, or okay to drink be, to drink beets beet juice if you boil if you boil the beet in water? I guess is it good or okay to drink beet juice if you boil it? Well, when you boil beets, you're going the beets. to remove the, the beets. Beet. Yeah, you're going to just remove some of the water solids. So that's not good. Uh, I would now you, I would advise unless you're going to cook them, you know, it's fine. But you're going to lose some of the nutrients in it by boiling it. Um, the water solids, you're going to lose it. Some vegetables you can boil or cook, like carrots. Carrots is a fat soluble. It it makes it better when you boil your carrot juice. But I would beets, uh, greens, or uh, cabbage. You can't boil them and maintain a healthy balance. 
So I would say, no, I wouldn't boil my beets unless you just want to make a soup out of it. And you're not taking it for those main essential water solids if you're making a soup out of it. Are there natural <laughs> remedies for sleep problems? There are, there are plenty. Um, uh, this is one where you need to discuss it because there are many reasons why people have sleep problems. And uh, one remedy may not be effective for someone else. Uh, but we do know that L-tryptophan is really good. Magnesium is good and calcium is good. And we know Ellen White said that catnip tea uh, relax and calm the body so it can sleep. So, uh, so there are things that can help, but there are other underlying problems with sleep conditions. And so those things need to be addressed. Okay, I, I know I'm going to have to end the question because we got one other program to do, and I got people around the world of waiting for the graduation. I wish I could be on here longer, but I, I just can't. Just do one it. question, just one Some, question, please. <laughs> the, for the for the um, eggplant tea, there are two kinds of eggplant. One is a nightshade, and the other one. Which one is the best one, or or it doesn't matter which one? Well, I just said a purple <laughs> eggplant. That's the, the one nightshade. I know about the purple eggplant. What a purple yeah, one! Yeah, but it's it's nothing wrong with the nightshade unless you got some kidney problems. Uh, but if you take it to lower your high blood pressure, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so well, I want to thank, thank the church there in Montreal. Uh, we've enjoyed a wonderful Sabbath with you and uh, you and the leaders there and the Health and Temperance Department. Uh, we have a team of medical missionaries here that are willing to come and to help you all as soon as they open up the borders. We'd be more than happy to come mm -hmm. and do what we can to prepare God's people for this crisis. So thank y'all so much. Thank you very much too. And we look forward to letting you know what the immediate plans of the future will be in terms of getting more follow-up on this. I think it's very, very informative. Yes. And, and practical. also it's always available to doing a training school on Zoom. Okay. You know, for your church. We look you into do that. that. Even if they Okay, very good. Thank you all so much. I hate to Thank run, you. but I'm, I'm running. We understand. Right. All right. Thank good you. Night. Thank you, Elder Naaman. God bless you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yes. Dear Father, which I in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for our dear brothers and sisters across the border. Be with them, Lord, and bless them, Lord. And be with the leadership there, dear Father. Protect them, dear Father. Lord, lead them into thy truth and shelter them, Father. Thank you so much in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Amen.